now it has been switched oh, on. Sorry. Thank you. Right. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, my Lord Grand, three A. Just briefly before I move to the partial release. Um, just remind me, what's three A? Grand three A set out in our skeleton, uh, paragraph six B. <coughs> uh, and this is the argument. I will admit, just worth mentioning it to your lordship again, because it was addressed on a different basis. I think I was considered because what she said was that this argument. Does that not interfere with the insolvency code for distribution? Um, I don't believe so, and that, that I think was what my friend Farage was saying. Um, it, it's, it, the debts are omitted to proof, but the question is then when they're payable, and because of the solvency condition, there's a clear issue of the parties agree. So I'd invite your lordship to look at that if that situation arises, because actually it is another answer that does give effect to the parties' agreement, even if there is an impasse at the earlier stage. My Lord Mayor, I partial release. Yes. Partial discharge, I guess. Rather than release. Anyway, yeah, whatever you want to call it. Um, can I start by addressing five points of principle that came up at different times in my learned friend's submissions, and then I want to show you the cases to show you why he's wrong on the interpretation. So the first point of principle is that my learned friend made a critical concession yesterday, and this was in response to my Lord Lord Justice Lewis piece, day four, pages 145 to 146. Because he accepted that if a contract of guarantee contains a principal debtor clause, part payments do discharge the debt pro tanto, and therefore 
do reduce the creditor's claim. So in other words, he accepts that we're right in any case involving the guarantee with a principal debtor pool. And he has to make that concession because it's the only way he tries to distinguish the cases of MS Fashions and Milverton, which, as the court pointed out, are otherwise binding. And I'll come on to show you why he's wrong in his construction on that. But what I would say is actually the concession is fatal to his case because what he's saying is a creditor with the benefit of a simple guarantee always has the right to prove the default debt. But a creditor with the greater benefit of a simple guarantee and a principal debtor pool is worse off because they always have to reduce. So that leads, as a matter of policy, to the absurd situation where the stronger contract, i.e. the one that gives you the principal debtor and guarantee pool, puts the creditor in a worse position. The second point was that my learned friend built his argument at the start on the basis that the bank had somehow misapproached the question of the relationship between the parties. And he suggested that the bank hadn't properly identified the issue of competition between the creditor and the surety. That was at day four, page 81, lines 20 to 23. Now, that's hard to understand as a submission because that was the heart of my submission, was at day three, pages 140 to 141. And the key point is that the special insolvency rule operates because otherwise, and I place emphasis on the word otherwise, there would be competition between the surety and the principal creditor. And it's the rule against double proof that prevents the competition from occurring. And essentially, our point of this rule, which it's well known, is that the release of the indemnity claim means that there can no longer be competition between the creditor and the surety. And that's why we say the special rule doesn't apply. So we obviously understand the competition aspect, and it's the lack of it that is the heart of my point. And what we also say is that unless the amount in that scenario for which the creditor can prove is reduced, the result subverts the pari-passu rule in an insolvency situation because the creditor receives a higher percentage recovery on what is actually owed as compared to other creditors. And my learned friend accepted that. But what he said was, to my Lord Lord Justice Henderson, that preferential recovery is simply a function of the guarantee. And that was at day four, page 80, line 16, to page 81, line 90. And he also repeated references to the guarantee being a form of security, day four, page 74, line 7 to 13. Now, I think this was the point that my Lord Lord Justice Henderson made. It rather depends on what we mean by security. Because guarantees are plainly contractual arrangements. They don't confer proprietary rights. And a guarantee may be secured, like a principal claim, but they are not usually referred to as security in real property respect. And that was my Lord's point. And in this case, the claim of the creditor against the estate is a personal claim. And if it's not secured, it has a right to participate with other creditors. And so there's no reason why it should do better in the estate's assets. And I'm putting, your Lordships will have seen that I'm putting the first two points, both in answer to my own friend, but also as a question of what the right analysis and policy, because as you have pointed out, it's judgment and law. And at the moment, the argument that the guarantee confers a benefit against the rights of other creditors seems hard to justify. The third point of principle was the question of unjust enrichment. My own friend's 100% point. My own friend is at pains to explain that on his approach, the 
creditor will never recover more than 100% of the debt owed. Uh, and I place emphasis on the word never. Uh, now that's a difficult submission to understand because the possibility of over-recovery is the necessary consequence of my learned friend's approach. Uh, and what it turned out in the end, and this was again a new point taken yesterday, that he meant that even if there was over-recovery on his approach, that wasn't a problem on the facts of this case. We showed you the settlement agreement. Section 204. That's right. But that's no answer, because as a matter of general law, there should be no overpayment. The money should never come out of the estate in the first place. And therefore, relying on a specific term is akin to saying, don't worry, the creditors promised to give the surplus to charity. That cannot be the way the law approaches it. And well, um, I mean, I think you can, you can, you can see that argument in a slightly sorry, different, Nathan, slightly. I just can't hear you. You, I'm so sorry. you can see that argument in a slightly different light. You, your argument is, well, the surety has released the claim against the principal debtor from indemnity. And in effect, I think the way that Mr. Phillips is putting it, although he didn't quite put it this way, is, well, no, you haven't really. What you've done is you've substituted a right of indemnity against the principal debtor by Section 204, which gives you a right against the creditor in the event of over-recovery. In other words, it's not um, a plain vanilla release of, of, of the surety's rights. That's I think that, that I think I that's, that's, that, that, that's how I understand the argument. That, that's right. And the reason I say it's obviously because it has to do with the argument before it. But obviously this is an entirely new point, mm -hmm. it's not failed not before yesterday. But it also is inconsistent with the submission that, first of all, uh, a release has no effect. And secondly, the creditor, when there is a release, and those that's what his submissions were until this point, will never recover more than 100% of the debt. Mm. Because as your lordship's saying, he's actually recharacterized the facts of this case to say that it wasn't really a release at all. Yeah. Um, so that's why we say as a matter of law, he's wrong on the analysis, irrespective of what we say the facts of this case were. So in other words, you're, what you're addressing is the situation would apply if there were what I've just called a plain vanilla release. Indeed. Yeah. And that's the basis on which this point has been argued. Yeah. Uh, my Lord, the fourth point of principle relates to the right of subrogation and the right of indemnity. Uh, and again, I think this followed from uh, discussions with the court. Because <laughs> Mr. Phillips tried to attack the bank's approach by taking you back to what he said was the origin of the insolvency. Uh, and also I'll show you, these are all cases in bankruptcy. Uh, and he was suggesting that our approach misunderstood the nature of the surety's rights. That was the Midland and the Inlay Community case. Uh, and I'll come on to those cases. The premise of his submission seemed to be that there was only a right of subrogation. Uh, and in response to questions from my Lord Lord Justice Lewiston and later Justice Atherton, my learned friend said, the surety has no right to make any claim against the debtor until the surety has paid its full liability. That was day four, pages 69 to 72. Uh, and his reasoning appeared to be based on the notion that the right of the security to recover from the debtor is dependent on being subrogated to the claim of the creditor against the debtor. But the surety, it's well established, certainly now, if not then, has a right of indemnity arising as soon as it makes and to the extent it makes any payment to the creditor. Uh, and that's clear from the cases, the Cattles case and Cuxley's decisions. They're both cited in Andrews and Millet at 13002. And that's your Lordship's reference is authorities bundled for tab 71, page 2363. Uh, and I think as my Lord Lord Justice Henderson pointed out in this dialogue, Subrogation is only one mechanism to give effect to the surety's underlying right to claim a pro tanto indemnity from the debtor. And it's important when the principal claim is secured because the surety is better off being subrogated to the creditor's rights. But the right of the surety is not limited to subrogation upon payment in full of the guaranteed debt. And 
to the extent the old cases use different language, it's not clear to me they were limiting it just to the right of suffragation. But even if they were, it's clear from the Tatsum case that that position is moved on. Under the law as it now stands, what is the right juridical analysis of this indemnity entitlement that arises, I think you're saying, immediately upon payment of the by the surety? I assume it's an implied contract. Well, it could be. Or perhaps it's another way of saying it is actually a form of subrogation because it operates as you go along rather than only when the debt is discharged. It could be. The other possibility is it's simply restitution for unjust enrichment. Indeed. And that's the way that the House of Lords seems to have approached it in Bank Financiera and Park Battersea, where I think they said you can be subrogated even though you've only paid off part. So it's not right to say it just arises when you've taken the full. And then taking me then to my fifth point of principle, and really this was the key plank, I think, of my own friend's argument, was he was claiming that the distinction between primary and secondary liability was the key. And the suggestion was that we were confused as to the nature of the surety's obligation. Now, there's no confusion on that part. The position is that the payment of the surety discharges both the secondary guarantee obligation and the underlying guarantee debt. So if the surety pays £50, it discharges the guarantee obligation to that extent and the underlying guarantee debt. And we submit that absolutely clear from NF Fashion and Milton and is entirely logical as to where it should be as a matter of policy. So, my lord, can I start at that point then looking at the authorities briefly? My learned friend cited two new authorities yesterday, which I'd just like to address briefly and then go back to what he said. Can I just ask you about your fifth point? The difficulty with the fifth point is fitting it into the route against double proof. Because I think it was in Stotter that Mr. Justice Fisher said, well, how can you prove for more than you're owed? But the cases do seem to suggest that you can. It may be that this is a judge-made rule about who has first crack at what's left in the insolvent estate. And that you can prove for more than you are in fact owed because of this special judge-made rule. And that's one possible explanation, which Mr. Justice Fisher didn't really buy. But if that is the explanation, it is a rather peculiar explanation. Well, my lord, I don't shy away from that. I would submit that is the explanation. And that it is the explanation is apparent from cases and the text which talk about otherwise there being competition. And so it's not suggested as any other reason. It's the competition that's the main point, exactly as my learned friend was urging on you. And it's called a special rule, we would suggest, because it's been introduced to deal with a particular scenario in insolvency. But as my lord, Lord Justice Henderson, I think, has said a number of times during the hearing, it's not ideal. But you have to accept, don't you, that in this situation, the creditor can prove for more than he is owed. Exactly. And that seems to be the essence of the, I'm afraid, the rule against double proof, is that he is proving for more than he's owed because the surety cannot. And it is judge-made. It's not very satisfactory. And we say, in this case, the ratio to it, the rationale is not there. I mean, sometimes in the older cases, it seems to be perhaps an attempt to paper over a contradiction in it by a sort of rather metaphysical notion that you owe the debt in its entirety until every penny of it has been paid. That's right. Which makes no economic sense. No. As I say, it's almost a sort of philosophical point. The whole thing has got to be discharged before you can say it's gone. Well, you see that very much from Ray Sass, the Midland Bank case, and Ray Reed. All three of them are at pains to say that construing the guarantee, even with a limit, you're still liable for the whole debt. And they take that approach. Now, that isn't the approach that Lord Justice Hoffman is in many ways. He obviously thought that was, and so did Lord Justice Glidewell. They both obviously thought that was a very strange thing to say. And as I'll remind you, I know you're familiar with them, the cases, 
clear as the snow. Mm. So even if there was a position of cedar trees, it doesn't seem to be the modern look at all. And it's really a species of legal fiction. Uh -huh. um, it's not something one wants to encourage. No, and it's, and it's outdated now. But the point it's fair to say, in modern guarantees, may arise less frequently, and it may be that's why there is less recently drawn. It's giving you the suspense of having another thing. Um, I'm going to forget it maybe. But it, it isn't right as a matter of law, we would submit, to suggest that a payment by a guarantor doesn't discharge the potential of the debt. Yeah, well, then you are forced back to the uncomfortable position that the creditor could prove more than he's owed. Yes. Mm. That's right. But I think that. A check for sepsis. I think one of the meetings says that to me first. Right. I don't shy away from that. That, that is the special rule. Mm. Um, and it's justified on a competition basis. So, my lord, just looking at the Midland Bank case, uh, <coughs> which my learned friend handed up, uh, I think it's an A589 in the clip. I don't know which. Yeah. Um, and the National Bank of Greece is Can I go to go in a moment? difference in this case. And in, in the Midland Bank case, 
there is in principle the possibility of the competing proof, albeit that might have been breach of contract between the surety and the creditor. But all this is showing is an application of the special insolvency rule, as opposed to the facts of our case where there's no possibility of a proof by the surety. The, the National Bank and Greece case adds nothing because it was argued on exactly the same basis. Uh, as you can see that, that's over the, uh, the next tab on. Uh, and if one looks at page 100 of the report, which is at page 242949. Um, you can see that from under uh, Bacon DJ, the peculiar form of bond gives the bank the right to retain their principal full amount. And what you see at page 102 of the report, which is 2949, it, at the very bottom, uh, it starts with your thinking, but the proviso is perfectly clear, which is about six lines up from the bottom. You read that to skip over the page. So what does Lord Justice mean, Lord Justice James mean further up the page, page 102? He says it's not the surety, not that he was surety only for £500, he was surety for the whole debt with the limitation. He had no equity arising out of any reduction of the ultimate balance if the principal debtor had paid part of the debt. What does that mean? That it wouldn't affect the position of the creditor. Equity surely is to, is to do with the rights of the surety. Uh, yes, but I was. Uh, it's no right to stand in the creditor's shoes. Which is the point. Oh, I see. Right. So, are we? I mean, are we getting to the position where what starts as a question of construction of the guarantee turns into a rule? Well, that's, that's how it's evolved. That seems to be. And, and what's odd about it is, as you said, see, the peculiar form of bond is interesting. Mm. But it becomes a rule in insolvency situations, as we see from Ray Sachs, but possibly also in Ray Sachs with respect, there seems to be the line that we looked at um, the second sentence, by the way, so it's just a tab one of the bundle, where Lord Justice. Williams in passing says common or right exactly yeah. and there just doesn't seem to be any basis for that as your lordship pointed out uh, and these cases don't exist <coughs> find it it's, and they were referred to for that purpose I think by my learned friend but they don't need to be properly mm. analysed mm. and then I think there is one of the cases that was cited to <coughs> Mr Justice Vaughan Williams which we haven't <coughs> referred to which suggests the contrary I think it's Commercial Bank of Australia and Wilson. But my Lord, irrespective, we would submit of, of that particular line, we say the position actually now is very clear outside of insolvency. Uh, and that comes from NF Fashions uh, and Wilverton. And just to stand back a moment, my learned friend has 
appear to be suggesting to the court two things. One is that the Court of Appeal decision of Justice Ward and Scott should be just ignored because it was an application for leave to commence the proceedings. And secondly, that because Milner v. Kingdon appears to have been cited very often, it is therefore seen to be not really worth putting much time to. That essentially seems to be the suggestion at one point. The position is actually quite clear. These are authorities of the Court of Appeal. They actually make the point in very clear terms with none of the limitations that were being read in. And one would have to disregard an awful lot of what was said in these to reach the position that my learned friend is urging to you. So if we look first at the authority he passed up yesterday in the MS fashion, that's tab 91. And if your lordship would look at, I think it was in fact, my lord and justice who has pointed out the passage at 287H. In the judgment of Lord Justice Scott. That passage makes it clear that Lord Justice Scott regarded it as beyond doubt that set off if it occurred would operate to release not only the surety but also the principal debtor. And similarly, Lord Justice Wolfe at page 289, letter 8. I'm sorry, what was the reference to the passage in Lord Justice Scott? It was 287 letters H to I, my lord. 287H to I, thank you. I'm sorry, I know it's easy to bundle references at the bottom, 295H. Thank you very much. And there's plenty of weight in there, particularly when you then read the main decision, which is at tab 16, which we've looked at primarily. But if we could go back to the passage at 448, letter D. I'm sorry, where do we find that? It's bundle 1, tab 16. Thank you. The page you wanted, 448. It's 448, the report is 296. The passage at letter D. So this is the passage in Lord Justice Dillon's judgment that we were debating yesterday. And our first point is that this is precisely and definitively on point. The discharge of a guarantor's liability to the creditor by payment, or in the case of set-off, reduces the guarantor's liability and also that of the principal debtor. So the same point that we've seen from the judgment of Lord Justice Scott and Lord Justice Wolfe. Now the argument being advanced by my learned friend is that it was only because the sureties were principal debtors. But that's wrong, and you can see that when you look at the judgment of Lord Justice Hoffman at paragraph, it's page 4362EF. And the passage starts, and I think this may be again, I'm giving this some ground because my Lord Justice Lewis can point that to me. But it's at letter D in my judgment of principal debtor. And if your Lordship could just read from letter D to F. I'm so sorry, again I'm finding these page references very confusing. I'm sorry my Lord, do you prefer the bundle reference? I think given that the print doesn't show the pages of the report, this is a failure. Oh I'm so sorry. It's paragraph page 284 of the bundle. 284 of the bundle. Thank you. And it's letters D to F, and it's in the judgment of Lord Justice Hoffman at first instance. I'm so sorry, I was looking at Mills and that's why I was getting in touch with Chris. Thank you. Can we, Your Lordship, just look back at the passage I had just referred to was in Lord Justice Dillon's judgment. Yes. And that was at 296. Yes. D to E, which I know you're familiar with. 
Yes. And then I was going back to the judgment of Justice Hoffman to see how this arose. Yeah. And this passage is extremely important in the judgment of Justice Hoffman because he is describing the guarantor as a principal debtor. Mm. And it, doing that doesn't stop the court looking at, he puts it, the underlying reality for some purposes. And crucially, the surety's equitable rights and the rule against double proof. And the only relevance in this case, as I think the Lord has pointed out, of the guarantor being a principal debtor was that the guarantor's liability wasn't contingent on demand, and so a mutual debt could be set off. And you see that in Lord Justice Dillon's judgment at 447H to 448C, and let me just give you the bundle of references. That is 295H to... 296. And crucially, when Lord Justice Dillon comes to consider the effect of set off, he plainly regards the sureties as guarantors, so, and he refers them as such to contrast them with the principal debtor. If he had only brought the relevance of the principal debtor, then the phrase would be nonsense in the judgment, because they would all be principal debtors. And my Lady, Lady Justice Aspen talked to my learned friend yesterday that the paragraph at, and it's bundled on page 296, letter B, 448 of the report, that paragraph B to C might qualify the more general statement of principle on which I rely. And the answer to that, my lady, is that the former paragraph explains why there is set off in this case. The latter paragraph is about the effect of the set-off, because it begins if there is set-off, and then there are the two points to merge. And the first point is that the set-off operates as if it were payment under the guarantee, and we get that from the sentence, it operates, and that's exactly as my Lord Lord Justice Lewison put it at day four, page 143, set-off is equivalent to payment. And the use of the word therefore in that sentence makes it clear that the reason why the payment by way of set-off reduces the liability of the principal debtor is because it's treated as payment under the guarantee. And set-off was only foreseen because it's a method of payment under the debt. And it was treated as such, just to your lordship's note, by Lord Justice Hoffman as well. And that was at um, page 277 of the bundle letter. A to B, which is 429 of the report. A to B, that's just reciting the facts. Mm. But that's the basis on which Lord Justice Hoffman was approaching this, is it was all presented as uh, a method of payment. Sorry, I think we're, I'm not sure we're looking at the right place. 429 starts 29th of June 1992, sought as against the bank. Go I'll, I'll check the reference. I'll, I'll check that again. The other point I just wanted to make on this while we're finding the reference is that page 286 of the bundle is 438 from the report letter F, where Lord Justice Hoffman specifically agrees with the analysis um, of Lord Justice Scott and Wolf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that is, as my Lord Lord Justice Lewison pointed out, the um, uh, position after Grace Sapp and Ulster Bank have been cited to. The second point, my Lord, is that given that the payment is treated as a payment under the guarantee, it engages the general rule stated in the uh, penultimate sentence of the passage we were looking at, of Lord Justice Dillon's judgment, which was at 296 of the report. And the rule isn't qualified couldn't be stated in more general terms, note the reference to a guarantor, not the guarantor. 
So if my Lord Justice, if the Lord Justice Dillon had meant only that a payment by a person treated as a principal debtor to a creditor reduces the principal debt, then he certainly wouldn't have referred to the position of a guarantor throughout this paragraph. And at page uh, 451 of the report and 299 of the bundle, Concludes by saying uh, at letter H that he dismisses the um, appeals for substantially the same reasons as those that we've discussed. Just, just to unpack the facts a little bit, because I think you just need to understand a bit. You've got L who grants a lease to T1. T1 assigns to T2 with surety S1. T2 then assigns to T3 with sureties 2 and 3. Yes, that's right. Reversion then changes hands. T3 goes bust. Landlord sues um, T1. Um, in fact, the sureties then pay a sum. Uh, first of all, it's um, uh, SL, S2 and S3 who pay for their release, and they pay 50,000 odd. Rent outstanding at that time is 19,500. S1 then pays a further 10,000 for his release, and the court decides the whole of it can be set off against rent then. That's what that's what's decided in the case. It just is, and that's a lot to have in terms of the facts. It's it's very clear um, on page three fifty of the bundle. And the question, my lord, is framed by Lord Justice Blindwell on page three four seven of the bundle, page three of the in general terms, uh, and you see um, that he answers the question at page 6 of the report, page 350 of the bundle, where he clearly distinguishes the, the role of principal, assignee, and surety, and he deals with the surety on the assumption that there has been a default by the profit taking the liability. And the payment by any of them discharges the guarantee, as we all discussed there in summary of the facts. Or oh, discharges the rent. That's right. Yes. And if one turns then to page 353 of the bundle, page 9, 
Well, Justice Hoffman takes the same approach, uh, and in particular in the paragraph that starts uh, Mr. Bailey, which is the third on, on the page, halfway down to the purpose of that sentence at the end of the paragraph. I'm sorry, I can't find that, so I'm on page, page nine or three page by three. Page nine or three by three. Just, yeah. just above the red line. Thank you. against double proof depends on characterising the two claims as two claims in respect of the same debt. Even though they are probably different debts, properly analysed. Properly analysed they are, but that's the fiction that's created by the insolvency regime. And it's one of the reasons why what I did say at the beginning that I, I, I accepted I had to overcome the insolvency regime, not just the position outside banking, outside the insolvency regime, because of that, that regime. Uh, just remind me which tab it's that is. tab 5 of oh, yes. 1 uh, and that it was discussed and not followed in Stotter um, and we simply say well it actually made sense because I'm going to point on it in have it in front I just wanted to say one thing about Alster Bank um, if you look at the facts, it seems that the payment um, which the sureties made was not actually appropriated to a debt, it was put into a separate account. Seems a suspense to, account. Into a suspense account. So it wasn't actually appropriated to, to the debt. But it wasn't in fact payment. No. And also, it seems to be um, a decision that does turn on the terms of the guarantee as well. Uh, and Westpac simply follows this case. And then finally, may I just, I know your Lordship has looked at it, but I can just um, ask you to turn up Octodar, which is at um, volume 2, tab 34. Oh, yes. 
behind you all. You see, the reasoning as to why it's a difficult submission to accept the guarantee of payment of the principal debt, not least in the light of interest accruing. Yeah, I, I think I just want you to tell me, if you wouldn't mind, what was the issue in the case? Um, it is Mr. Justice McMurdo saying that because the pay part payment by the surety has reduced the debts, the creditor can only prove the balance. If that's what he's saying, then he is not applying the rule against double proof. He's not saying that. I understood you to accept that even though the amount for which the creditor um, even though the, the amount of the balance owing to the creditor has been reduced, he can still prove the entirety of the debt, the original debt. Yes, I am. I was understanding him to also be talking about the effects of clause um, 42B. And Sorry, 42B. Where, where is it? That's probably set, set out somewhere, isn't it? It's been set out in paragraph 63. 63. understand you put in some written submissions after the hearings. Well, it's in our, as I recollect, it's in our opening. My learned friend didn't respond to it in yeah. opening. He responded it to us in reply. We well, were then given permission to... Not terribly it. interested in these grumbles. I understand that. I didn't want it to be suggested that this was a new point and that the fact is, with respect to the judge, it was a square, square point. And um, he didn't agree with it, but... Well, I mean, it's an important issue of law, so we obviously we want, we want to look at it in the round, regardless, as long as nobody is taken by surprise in this court. No, certainly nobody not. Nobody suggested. Certainly not. I'm um, just, can I just find out from you where this is going? <coughs> we, we've got to the position, I think, where you say, well, the payment by the surety um, discharges the debt pro tanto. Nevertheless, the creditor is entitled to prove the whole debt. You say, not in this case, the creditor must only prove the balance. And that then turns on the release. Exactly. And we say, so we say the general rule outside insolvency is clear. It's not what my learned friend says. It's very clear. But there is a special rule in insolvency just about proof, which creates a legal fiction for proving purposes, the underpinning rationale of that strange rule is that there is a competing debt owed to the surety and that the estate must not be faced with two competing claims. Here there is no such competing claim, therefore the special rule shouldn't be applied because the rationale for it simply doesn't exist. My lords, I do not rise by way of seeking to make submissions in rejoinder. Can Good. I just make that clear from the start? But I rise 
uh, in order to assist with your Lordship's question before my learned friend started her position. Well, before the guarantee. Yes, may I just very briefly make a few points? Uh, and whilst I do this, could I ask the associate to hand the guarantee to your Lordship? And I know my learned friend's going to object. Please don't look at it. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I do object to this, I must say. I'm not going to take it entirely well, up to the court, but it, can it, I, this is going to be the mainstay of this uh, little run. Well, uh, let's just hear what Mr. Phillips has got to say. Yeah. We, either we will take it into account or we won't. <laughs> Um, my lords, I don't want to, your lordships to look at it at this point. I, I, may I just explain? Uh, uh, we understood that it was common ground, uh, and my lady, of course, it was, my lords uh, and lady, we understood throughout that it was common ground that the guarantee did not give rise to a primary liability, but only to a secondary liability. And that is obvious and was obvious from all the skeleton arguments. And for a reason that I will show your lordships, I hope, in a moment, uh, that is because it would have been an impossible point to take. Uh, I'm not going to get into when points were and were not raised, but in relation to this, one point I would make is, of course, this is Deutsche Bank's appeal, and if they were going to take the point that this created a primary liability, rather than it being my point... Well, no, I, I think that... I think that, that the point arose because of the way in which you explained MS fashions. Okay. My Lords, would you please turn to uh, the second page of this, uh, and I can show you the guarantee language. To what, to what is it as an exhibit? Uh, th this is... Uh, uh, we don't know, but this is a resolution. This is the guarantee. Um, can I just show you the guarantee terms are at the top of the second page, and it is resolved that the company hereby fully guarantees the payment of all liabilities, obligations, and commitments of the subsidiaries, and the subsidiaries are set forth in a schedule, each of which shall be a guarantee subsidiary for the purposes of the code. And the code being some insolvency code? No, it's the code. Um, it's, um, Oh, the Code of Authorisation. Also, code that's, of authorization. It, that's, its, that's its Articles of Association. Yeah, yes. Like I'm sorry. Um, but but, but the, 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 the short point, and it, it is to assist your Lordships, and your Lordship did ask this question, and um, the short point is it's clear on the face. Your Lordships don't need evidence of Delaware law. You are dealing with a secondary liability. And in the context of your Lordship's judgment on this matter, I thought that it was appropriate that you should see uh, what it is that my Lord, your Lordship, has been asking for. Yeah. Unless I can help further. That was the only thing. No, thank you. Uh, Ms. Tulaney, do, do you want to say anything about this? Um, my Lord, I'm just taking instructions because I'm told it's not quite as straightforward. Oh, all right. Do you want us to go away for a couple of minutes? Query he had was what then happened um, in the plan that compromised this guarantee, which was the stop here, uh, and then it got put to the So what in leading up to the settlement agreement? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, was, I don't. <laughs> um, I think the query was, could this document simply be read in isolation, or did it get amended or altered or interpreted differently in the context of the plans that then followed separately for the guarantee and the of the remission of the claim? That, that's all I can say. We, we are not taking any point on primary debtor or not as you understood my position to say that's a misleading yes. on the debt. Yes. It was really actually.